This week's episode is sponsored by Ryan at Change. If you are looking to get involved in e-commerce and build a successful online business, then check out my good friend Ryan, who I have been working with the last few years and attended many events and retreats all around the world, spending time with members who are making some serious money. I have been promoting Ryan for a while now because I believe in what he does and not only has he helped and supported me build my own businesses, but I have seen firsthand how he helps and supports his members take their businesses to new levels and give them financial freedom. So if you are interested in getting into e-commerce and building successful online stores, then message Ryan on his Instagram at RyanJB to join his winning team. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Lilo Brancato. Lilo, Thanks. absolute honour to have Thank you on. James, I appreciate you yeah. having me on, brother, really. A Bronx Tale, one of my greatest films of all time. Unbelievable. You, De Niro, absolute classic. Timeless. For me, probably De Niro's, I don't know, it's, it's underrated part, but I don't know if it's because he wasn't the star in it, but it's one of his finest parts for me. The bus driver talking about the... The working man's the, the tough man. For me, that, that that is so true. I interview enough people to realise if you're providing for your family positively and legitly, you are a tough man. You are a strong man who's doing the right things. One of the greatest films of all time. You've also appeared with uh, Mark Wahlberg, Will Smith, Danny DeVito, um, working with some of the biggest names on the planet. You've battled Denzel with Washington. Denzel Washington. Yeah. You battled with addiction. You ended up in prison. A cop got killed. Mad story. Like I said, I think you're an unbelievable actor. It's an absolute honor to have you on the show today. Thank you, and it's an honor to be on the show. Um, also, you know, with De Niro, it wasn't even so much that he wasn't the star of the film. It was more about the character that he played. He played the regular guy, the good guy, the role, a role that people don't usually think of him as playing. You know what I mean? A role that's not really him. And I got to say, I think it was one of his better ones. I think it was one of his better roles. He fit beautifully into that role as Lorenzo. You know, before we get into it, no brother, I always like to go back to the start with my guests, get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up, and how it all began. Okay, um, you, you're talking about the film and how I was oh, right back to the start of your life where you grew up. Oh, okay, well, you know, I was adopted when I was four months old uh, from Bogota, Colombia, from Italian, you know, like off, you know, like immigrant Italian parents because they didn't think they could have kids, they had a miscarriage, and then they looked to adopt, they saw pictures of different babies, they saw me, liked me. And decided they want to adopt me. And I guess it's a very psychological thing because I guess the pressure was off my mom. She ended up pregnant with my brother Vincent. So my brother Vincent and I are nine months apart. He's born, I'm born August 30th, 1976. He's born May 12th, 1977. So my mom used to dress us like twins and stuff when we were kids. Mm -hmm. But I came to uh, Yonkers, New York, which is about 20 minutes north of New York City. It's like right next door to the Bronx. It's, they call it the sixth borough. It's like right there. I grew up in Yonkers, middle class, you know, I always had the, had a great, great childhood, great upbringing, a lot of positivity, a lot of good people around me. You know, we grew up in a predominantly Italian neighborhood. There was one Puerto Rican on the street next door. They're still there. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was a good childhood. Um, I was, you know, I was a good student in school. I always did well, but I wasn't good. Uh, my, my behavior wasn't good. I was always, you know, wanted to be the class clown and always being disruptive and getting in trouble. So because of that, I had got thrown out of a few schools. Um, and then it was 10th grade. I had been thrown out of two schools. I was on my third school. I finished the year out. And it was that summer of 1992 that I heard about a film called A Bronx Tale. 
they're like, yo, De Niro's making this movie and he's looking for a kid to play the son who's like around our age because I was like 16, 17. So it was like the talk of the town. Everybody was talking about it. And, you know, you would, oh, you know, Jerry, he got the part because they're using his aunt's store in the movie. All this, all this nonsense that you would hear. But it's kind of intimidating and it kind of deters you, kind of, you know what I mean? Because it's like, like talking about all these people had, somebody has to have the part. And it's such a long shot that they would give somebody like me the part. So I was there that day on the beach, July 5th, 1992. I was discovered by a casting scout, Marco Greco. My brother called me out of the water because my brother got wind of what the guy was doing. He was handing out flyers, looking for a kid to play my character in the Bronx Tale, Calodro, the character of Calodro. And my brother automatically realized that it was perfect for me because I looked like De Niro. I, you know, studied De Niro. I used to, you know, watch his movies. So it was a perfect situation. I was on the beach, did some impersonations. The guy loved it. Um, and then I got called down to New York City, De Niro's uh, Tribeca Productions. Do you know what Tribeca means? No. It means triangle below Canal Street. Because Canal Street's here, and then this triangle, that's Tribeca. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I just a little, little, yeah, yeah. a little fun fact. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, so I would go down there to Tribeca Productions and... The first day I went down, there was like, you know, 50 kids. And then the next day I got called back. There was less and then less and less and less. And then it got to the point where it was just me. <clears throat> and then, you know, at that point I had met De Niro. Uh, and we were working together on a daily basis. And he really liked what I was doing. And one day he said, I want you to dress like you're going to church. I want you to dress up nice. We're going to put you on camera. We're going to put you on film. Do a screen test. Because it's different. You know that. Yeah. You may look one way, but then on film you look different. Some people's features may be too strong and too pronounced. And then on film, it's even more. You know what they say. Oh, my God, you know, TV adds this much weight and mm -hmm. film. So everything is bigger. So we did the screen test. And that day is when I discovered that I was not the only person up for that role. It was also the kid who shot Sonny at the end of the film. But he was older. He was 21. I was 16. So it was kind of an easy decision for them. <clears throat> not really based on who was a better actor, but who was more right for this character. What do we want from this character? I mean, you want the character to be a little vulnerable, a little naive. And I just think at 16, it works better. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. At 21, be a little bit more set in your ways. Like you're already, you already got to that point of the crossroads and like you already started going this way. But I think at 16, that didn't, that didn't happen yet. So, we did the screen test that day. All the other different characters, you know, the finalists, they did all their different parts. And then it was me versus this guy, Phil Garbarino, who's still my friend. I just talked to him. Um, could you imagine that? We're still friends. You would think this guy would hate me. <laughs> He's still, when I was in prison, yeah. he used to come see me. It's a good man, Phil. I love that. Yeah, yeah. He yeah, turned yeah. out, he turned to be, a, you know, union electrician. Yeah. yeah a a lot guy. of people would go that. So there's no hate at all because that could have changed his life. Of course, of course it did. You know, he even, he wrote something. He wrote something called The Guy Who Whacked Sonny. That could be pretty interesting because it's like, you never really, like, they don't make the movies about oh, the guy. Oh, for the follow-up. Yeah. Yeah. The Guy Who Whacked Sonny. It's just too much of a classic, I think, to touch. Yeah. The way I would do it, though, I would do a story of his character in the movie. Yeah. It would happen simultaneously. To mm -hmm. what happened with the Bronx Tale. That is a good idea. But he could go, he could, his character, because his father got killed, yeah. remember? Mm -hmm. Put him on another side of the Bronx. And maybe like, you know, because, you know, his mom's got cancer. His father's dead. He's a star baseball player. And maybe he's missing all the breaks because he's got to take care of his mother. Mm -hmm. And that anger and that resentment, not having his dad, Sonny killed him. And he didn't have a proper, you know, childhood. Mm -hmm. And he feels like a lot was stolen from him. You know what I mean? And maybe like him and some other guy could smoke a joint and he can tell him the story about the father and why he was killed. And maybe even a couple of scenes, you see him walk up to the bar, like right to the corner, maybe look around the corner, stalk Sonny. And then that last day, have him go right in there and do mm -hmm. what he did. And as he comes in, you see me. Remember I saw him, mm -hmm. but there was this one face. It just wasn't smiling. But now he could, he's POV of me, Sonny. Sonny, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It could be interesting because think about it. He could be like the Joker and I'm Batman. Look how much money the Joker made. That Joker made more money than any of the Batmans. Yeah. People like that because he's like the villain, mm -hmm. but he's not really a villain. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think it could be a cool little Definitely. story. Yeah, yeah. You've but, sold me, mate. You've yeah, fucking yeah. sold it to me yeah, yeah. in two minutes. 
Yeah, because think about the pain. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it makes the, sense. You know, the resentment. Like, yeah. this this guy's a somebody, man. He, You know, you saw him crying at the father's funeral. I was watching him through the window. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. That could have been my dad. It could have been your dad. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing he dies, but to know he got murdered in the street like that, that's something, that's a tough pill to swallow, you know? Yeah. But, yeah, so we read that day. We went, you know, scene for scene. And then that was a Thursday. By Sunday night, they told me they wanted to see me. And then they... uh they decided to go with me, you know? I feel so busy. Like, sometimes I think about what he felt when they told him we're going to go with the other guy, crushed him. I mean, it's not even like they could have gave him a part as one of the friends because he was too old. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 21 and 16 is a big difference. When you're 47 and 42, it's not a big difference. But 16, you look different in the next year. You grow and everything changes. So he just, it's kind of like he did, really did get the short end of the stick, but he's such a good guy. Still my friend to this day, Phil Garbarino. Um, and I wish him all the best. You know, he's got some stuff going on. But yeah. And then after that, I went and got myself an agent. Um, and then I pursued my acting career. How was your partying before the Bronx deal? Say again? How was your partying and stuff before? Was I partying? Yeah, before no. the Bronx deal. Was it during Bronx deal you started smoking weed and shit? Yeah, that's when I started smoking. <clears throat> I started smoking with that kid, Phil. He drove me home one night and he had some weed in the car. I didn't know what it was. So he was like, oh, you want to try it? I said, yeah, I'll try it. So we tried it. I didn't get stoned that night. So then we smoked again on the set. But I wasn't really a party. Like, I mean, a little drinking on maybe a Friday night, two or three cold beers. I'd be drunk, screaming and yelling. I'd go to sleep and that mm -hmm. was it. But that wasn't a big deal. But the Bronx tale and the success of the film and just everything, the way it played out, that was a big catalyst as to, you know, why. I ended up where I ended up, ended up, and so fast. It happened really fast. Did anybody ever tell you when it was blown up to just be careful and look out for the, the kind of devilish things around you? Or was it just unexpected that it would go so big? Well, you know, like De Niro told me, De Niro said, listen, you got to really be careful, and you got to really, you know, there's going to people going to be coming at you from all different directions. But I didn't really understand that. My parents couldn't really give me the right advice because they didn't have experience in this. So, like, what are they going to say? You know, just be good. That's all they would say. You know, but they don't know that Hollywood, it, you know, and just the nature, it's like the, na you know, it's the nature of the beast. There's so much going on all at once and then nothing's going on. You know what I mean? It's just like, what just happened? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like kind of, it's a very emotional roller coaster being in you know being an actor and stuff like that um and i feel for so many actors they base their worth on whether or not they're working and i'm so glad for myself that i was able to discover something else that i love and that's helping other people with drug addiction and stuff like that and to me that's more rewarding and more gratifying yeah it's great to do a film and you got a film coming out but i've always said like to me for some kids parents to call me and say, hey, Lilo, you saved my son's life or my daughter's life. Thank you. I, I got my kid back. To me, that's more powerful. You know what I mean? But I think the fact that I do still make films and if I do become very successful once again, that can only help what I'm doing because people can look at that and say, well, look at this guy. He stayed the course. He's, you know, he's sober and he's doing the right thing and he's got a career again. But that's the, the only reason why that happened was because he stayed sober. And yeah. it shows with sobriety, anything is possible. What was the feeling when you got the part, though? <clears throat> oh, it was very surreal. I couldn't even really... De Niro, biggest actor yeah, of all yeah. time. I couldn't even really grasp it. It was like... Were you numb to it? Yeah, because like... I was 16, so everything... I was not even 16. I was 15, going to be 16. Everything was happening so fast that it almost felt like it right, like it was supposed to happen. But then... It really all hit me when the film came out because that's when you see the, when they know you're in the film, okay, they're going to start to treat you different, but when they actually see it, then it hits them as well. And then it's like, you got all these people coming out out of everywhere. I even had this one woman that tried to say she was my mother. I told you I was adopted. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this one woman tried to say she was going to my uncle's restaurant, my uncle, rest in peace, my uncle Sal. He had a restaurant in Armand, New York, and successful Italian restaurant called La Scala. And this woman and her husband used to go there all the time, and she saw the poster. 
And then she, you know, my uncle said, oh, this woman wants to talk to you. And she tried to say she was my mom, but it's, it wasn't possible. Just because the years and the timing, it just didn't work out. It wasn't possible. But just goes to show what people will do. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? When someone... Yeah, becomes famous. Yeah, it's crazy. Why do you think that film became one of the greatest of all time? I just think it has so much in it. I think it has a little bit, a little bit for everyone. It had the father-son story. It had the love story. It had the mafia, the whole mafia element, which people love. And I think it was great the way they had Joe Pesci. Because you don't know it's him. And then he comes back at the end. It makes you watch the film again. And say, oh, yo, that was him. When he remember, you know, so. So. I just think it, there's so many life lessons. There's so many. It transcends time. You could watch it 40 years from now. And the message is, because there's not only one message. There's few messages in that film are going to still be relevant and are still going to apply to whatever time period we're in. So I think that's just the reason why the film is so... I mean, it's beautifully written, beautifully acted. And I think it was a great idea for him to go and cast unknown actors as opposed to to doing it the Hollywood way where there's nothing wrong with that <clears throat> because if I'm putting up <clears throat> you know that movie <clears throat> that film costs like 15 20 million and that was in 92 that was a lot of money back yeah. then. you know what I mean that was like the equivalent of like 50 or more 50 60 million dollars but that's a big risk for someone putting up that kind of money it's like you want to do this with unknown actors you know it's the actors it's the names who put people in the seats. Oh, Tom Cruise. Oh, Johnny Depp. When they hear that, they love, you know, they love these actors. So they're going to go see what they're doing. Mm-hmm. But now you have a film. Well, you had De Niro and he was making his directorial debut, but he wasn't the star of it. So now you want to ask people to come and see a film and, and pay for it with actors that we've never seen before. So that's kind of a gamble. But I think that it it, it, it definitely, definitely worked out. What was it like? And was that a box office mask? Because I think the Shawshank, no, the Shawshank yeah. Redemption again that flopped, and then when it came out on like videotape, it ended up again one of the biggest films of all time, one of the greatest. This episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over one hundred and fifty stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. Yeah, no, it didn't do well. Box office, it did not do well. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't know. I just think maybe because of, other than De Niro, that lack of a big name. You know? Mm -hmm. Maybe, I don't know. It came out in September, so I don't know. I really can't say. I would think something like that. Like, I know for, if it was, like, for me, if I'm sitting there watching TV and I hear that Robert De Niro, oh, directorial debut, oh, wow, a Bronx Tale, and it shows that little bit of the wise guy stuff, and the, I would go see it in two seconds. Yeah. So what happened after a Bronx Tale then? Was life going good? Be, yeah, life because was Because you're, you're apparently one of the, bit, the next Robert De Niro people were saying, you're the next big thing. Did, was that so much pressure on your life then, or could you enjoy it? any moment of it you know i didn't really care i was a kid i just wanted to go hang out and go to my high school prom and hang out with my friends at summer vacation because that happened so fast that i didn't really work for it it just kind of happened that i didn't really appreciate it the way i should have you know what i mean so it was just like i mean if i could go back but you know we can't do that but you know everything i think worked out the way it should have so you ended up in is it Renaissance Man with Renaissance um, Man. Danny DeVito? And then you done Will Smith, Enemy of the State. That was a great film. Yeah, Enemy yeah. of the State. That was a great film. Yeah, yeah. Enemy, Enemy of the State. State. Again, yeah, that could be stuff that's happening now. Yeah, yeah. With all the fucking madness and the government and all yeah, the bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that film, I wish I would have had a bigger part. <clears throat> that was the same director of uh, from Crimson Tide. That was Tony Scott. So mm-hmm. he just offered me that role. And I said, it's a small thing, you come, you know what I mean? They paid me well, they took care of me. Mm-hmm. And Tony, you know Tony Scott, right? Yeah. He's a British guy. He's a brother Ridley. Tony, I think, jumped off a bridge. He had mm-hmm. inoperable brain cancer. One of the best guys, one of the best people in Hollywood I have ever met. And I'm sure a lot of other people will say the same thing. 
Tony Scott was a great guy. And I know for a fact, if he if he was still alive, he would work with me at this point in time because he was just that kind of guy. Mm. You know, and I remember stories I would tell him. I remember my cousin, he was involved in the Fulton Fish Market back, you know, this was big in New York City and it was like that whole organized crime element. And I remember my cousin was telling him stories about that. He was like really fascinated. He's a good guy, Tony Scott. Mm -hmm. And when I saw him, he goes, oh, no, not you again. <laughs> he said, oh, no, not you again. <laughs> but he offered me the role, you know. Mm. He helped me eat. Uh, he, he asked how my dad was doing because when I did Crimson Tide, I was only 17, turned 18, so I needed a chaperone. Mm -hmm. So he remembered my dad, and he was such a respectful good man. I hope that his family is okay, and I hope they've been able to like bounce back, you know, yeah. as, as well as possible. The sad that. Yeah. How was Denzel Washington? Oh, he's a great guy. Is he, I watch his interviews, and the words of wisdom he's got as well. You just know he's on it. He's on. He understands life. <clears throat> for me when you watch him he just seems like a good guy you would want to spend time with same as De Niro they just when you see them you can judge people off camera sometimes you get it wrong but sometimes you go and you just know when you meet him off camera he's going to be stand up yeah, guy Denzel you can, <clears throat> he's, he is filled with wisdom he said life is about two things commitment and consistency without commitment you'll never get started and without consistency you'll never get finished you'll never finish and that's wow it's like it's real. Yeah. You got to be committed, right? Mm -hmm. And in, to start and then to finish, you got to be consistent. But uh, I love him as a person, as an actor. He was, he's from right next door. <clears throat> he's from Mount Vernon. It's a neighboring city to where I'm from. I'm from Yonkers. He's from Mount Vernon. So like, you know, we're very, like we knew, he knew where I was from. I knew where he was from. So we would like tell stories and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Denzel Washington is a great guy. Love to work with him again. But the, the names you've worked with and been around, Will Smith, Denzel Washington. Gandolfini. So yeah, some of the greatest actors of all time. Sopranos. Yeah. Like, fucking hell, yeah. man. Like, yeah. The big Tony Soprano. Yeah. Like, for yeah. me, The Sopranos is the best show. Again, I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass, but a Bronx Tale Sopranos, I love that sort of stuff. Yeah, They're yeah. amazing. They just, the way they handle themselves, the way they walk, the way they talk, the acting, the production, yeah. the clothes, yeah. everything, the cars. Sopranos, Sopranos was unbelievable. You know, because it's like at that point in time, that type of, you know, that genre has been done. It had been done so many times. So it's like, how are they going to come out with a new show? They're going to keep it fresh, new, interesting, but not lose authenticity. So I read for that first, I read for the first season for Brendan Fallon, the kid who gets shot in the eye in the bathtub. I didn't get the part. They didn't even know if they were going to get a second season. They didn't even know if the show was going to be that big. But when I saw the coming attraction and I saw Gandolfini, because I knew him from Crimson Tide. Remember, he had yeah, a small yeah, yeah. part. <clears throat> so I'm thinking, that's who they chose for this show? This show's, <laughs> show's going to suck. <laughs> this show's going to suck. It's going to be on two, three episodes. Of God. <clears throat> and uh, boy, was I wrong. Mm -hmm. it's one of the best one of the best shows ever. Yeah, you know, that, I, I liked. I liked The Wire. And mm -hmm. I liked Breaking Bad. Yeah, Breaking Bad was class. That's another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Breaking Some Bad. amazing shows now. But for me, The Sopranos... That's the best. Then he played an amazing part, man. Oh. He played it to a T. Yeah, without him, without him, that show, he was like a tour de force. Like he was on a different level. Mm -hmm. He took that because he looked like what those guys look like. You know, like sometimes you see these actors, they make them look so good. It's almost like a caricature yeah. of what they're supposed to be. But then you got Tony Soprano, bold, fat. That's real. <laughs> he seemed like a guy. Tony seemed like a guy that would smash your face in with his fat butt. Yeah. Just be right. He looks like the type of guy. He was so believable in that role. <clears throat> and I wish they would have uh I wish they would have made the movie. You remember how they they, they yeah. made the answer? Why doesn't that work? They did the Many Saints and yeah, work. It wasn't yeah. yeah, but you need a you need a Gandolfini. Mm -hmm. You need a Gandolfini in that. Okay. You know that's a play on words, right? Mm -hmm. The Many Saints of Newark. Do you do you know what that means? No. Okay. Do you so remember? Was that? It's a play on words. Okay. Okay. Multi Santi means many saints. Mm -hmm. So they're from Newark. So that's why this, the, the, the title's called the Many Saints of Newark, the Multi Santis. Multi means mm -hmm. many, Santi. Multi Santi, many saints. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I heard that, I was like, all right, cool. This is probably going to be good. Uh, it didn't tell me enough. Like, I didn't learn. I wanted to really like learn where these characters came from. And, you know, how they came to be. 
And I don't think that film in, was that... It wasn't informative enough. i seen the trailer for it and it looked good, but I just I was disappointed <clears throat> with it because Sopranos was just exceptional. So to, to have any sort of success where it had to be better it had to be just as good or better right. but it was just nowhere near it because Sopranos was so good well you know as you got very big shoes to fill yeah Sopranos is very big shoes to fill so the only way they could have made that I think is you needed Gandolfini you miss you miss you were missing that that mm -hmm. that whole piece he is the Sopranos you know what I mean he mm -hmm. is the Sopranos and uh I'm so glad to have worked with him before he was, you know, like people even know who he was. Because when people bring that up, I'm like, yeah, I knew him from like, you know, when I was a little kid. Because mm -hmm. I was like, I was like 17 years old. You know? How did you handle the fame? I didn't handle it well. You know, I didn't have experience. I got caught up in the, you know, the fast life and the nightlife. And then I made so many bad mistakes and so many bad choices. So in one word, how did I handle it? Horribly. You know? What was your circle of friends like? leeches no i mean i have my friends that i grew up with yeah that you know that they did tag along but not i don't want to say tag alongs but they were my friends and even though they would have been my friends without the movies yeah yeah day ones they would have been yeah they mm. would have been my friends no matter what but they enjoyed the ride and they deserve it because they were always good friends to me the guys i was always around but then you do get those leech type people that start you know because that kind of once they see you in films and stuff that kind of that that whole you know that kind of that element, it kind of like gravitates towards you and people just don't know how to help themselves and they'll do everything, anything. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To just ride your coattail and stuff like that. But it's like, they'll give you, they'll give you drugs and this and that thinking. And you're thinking, this guy's all right. Look what he's doing. He's giving me all this and everything's cool. But they're doing it just because they know you're young. They know you're vulnerable and they know if this stuff, they give you this stuff, they'll be able to control you a little bit better. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line, you know? When did your life start to slip, though? When did you start missing additions? And, or did you still handle it? Because when you're young, you know, your tolerance is quite strong, so you can fucking still win a lot of out, shit. get wake yeah, up the yeah, next yeah. day and go right to work. Mm, yeah. I would say, you know what? Because I started, you know, at like 18 with the cocaine and stuff like that, that even by 22, like, because I went so hard, by the 22, I was already like, psh, my mind was half gone because I would experience that paranoia. And that stuff still, it's still part of the way my brain is wired to this day. I still get paranoid and weary of people. Like, why is that guy doing that? And is this, and that's all because of those nights being paranoid. So I would say like in my early twenties is when I started to lose control, started missing auditions and stuff. So it was like, it was like six, seven years of just, you know. Because Spielberg came calling Saving Private Ryan for an audition with you, is that correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. Saving I, Private Ryan. I didn't Ryan. have the part, but, you know, he yeah. wanted to meet me. Steven Spielberg wanted to meet me for the Vin Diesel role, and he was in New York. You know what I mean? He was mm -hmm. in New York, so he was like, you know, 25 minutes from where I lived, and he, I had an appointment with him in the room. And I did coke the night before, which I, never, I knew I shouldn't have, but I said, oh, no, I'll be all right by the morning, and I missed it. And I missed it, and you know, I mean, like it was like you know, the first you, the first ten fifteen minutes of that film is yeah, yeah, but unbelievable, even, yeah, yeah, right in the beach, oh, yeah, yeah, that's probably one of the best scenes of fucking old time as well. Yeah, yeah. That's unbelievable, like that and close. the Oscars that one as well. Does that does that play because you've already started world class films and programs anyway? But does that play in your mind, or do you think even if you got that part of enhance your stardom, and you might be fucking dead because you just went totally nuts i think it happened the way it was supposed yeah, to because so. my fame would have heightened mm -hmm. would have went to a new new heights and and you know my personality is my personality that doesn't change i got that very addictive you know personality and you know i'm just you know not that someone lost their life you know I'm, which i'm sure we're going to talk about but i wouldn't change a thing other than that part because someone did lose their life at the hands of my addiction but uh I'm content. I'm happy. I could, you know, go to sleep at night and I could wake up with my, you know, and be, I'm, you know, I'm proud of who I am, what I've become. And, uh, you know, yeah, listen, you know, some bad, you know, I made some very bad mistakes in the past and bad choices. And, you know, you see some of the consequences of those bad choices, but 
I don't think she, we should be defined by that. I mean, if we're st if you're still doing the same thing, you made bad choices and you're still making them, then you can kind of be defined by that. Like this guy's this, or this mm -hmm. girl, you know what I mean? But I think that I've worked really hard to show the world that I am not what people thought I once was. And, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm happy. I'm happy. Yeah. You're looking fresh. Listen, the talent will still be there. Do you know what I mean? You're doing amazing. <clears throat> Anybody changes fucking hard. It's it difficult. It doesn't matter who you are, what sort of fame or money you have. It doesn't matter if you're homeless, a billionaire. People struggle. People are always, you don't, you don't know what's around the corner. We can end up getting high tonight. Right. You're absolutely. <laughs> you, just, you just genuinely don't know. There's, we've all got those triggers. I like to believe everything's in control, but I think about the pressures and stresses of life. I think a little fucking sniff here and right. there, but. Are you in recovery yourself? Yeah, I'm yeah. six years, bro. Yeah, you're good for yeah, you. Yeah, 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 drink, drugs, gambling, so. I know. Oh, you like to gamble, tell oh, everything, bro. I wrote a fucking, I wrote a screenplay. Yeah, you my can swear, bro. You can my swear. characters, my characters, a gambler. Yeah, yeah. But it's a, it's addiction. That's man. a hidden it's, addiction. Yeah, of if course. If you're it is. on the other stuff, you can't really hide that for so long. The gambling, you can hide. My mum always knew when I was gambling because I would get angry. She says you were gambling again, and I used to fucking lose my head and say I'm not, but you're just lying to yourself. Yeah, yeah. Everything's yeah. a lie. Yeah, yeah. And don't get me wrong, listen, I miss. As much as that fucked up life was, I stuck part of me still misses that because that James never gave a fuck because it was selfish. There was a weird, it's a weird thing. There seemed to be, even though I was in pain, the stuff that I'd done made the pain worse. But it was a time where it numbed the pain for a few hours a day. When you become straight and try to do the right things, you're in constant fucking pain, but it's you're just handling it better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you're absolutely right, dude. Like, you, know, you never know what the fuck. Yeah. Like, we could go out there right now and, like, fuck everything up. It yeah. takes one second. It takes that one second, all that work that we put into this, it's yeah. out the window. It's like a reputation, right? Yeah. You take a whole life to build a good one, and then when you tell this guy, fuck you, one time, <laughs> it's gone, right? Yeah. How about, crazy how, because how, about how many times I bought you lunch, <laughs> you cheap fuck? Because my, when I, I was on the coke, Valium, weed, vodka, but you were, you seem to have done everything. When, what sort of stuff were you taking? Well, I tried meth. I never really liked it. I used to snort heroin and I smoked crack. That was my niche. That's what I liked the best. Yeah, why snort heroin? Why not smoke it or... Or shoot it? Yeah. Well, but shooting it's just a different level. But I, I don't know people who snorted that. I know people used to put it in joints sometimes. Yeah, well, no. I, when you snort it, it's... I think when you when you smoke it, it's... I think you waste it. Even when you were smoking out of the tinfoil. Yeah, Tracy just, Dragon. Yeah, yeah. I just think that... Uh, I just think that it's a waste. Snorting, it's like coke. You, you know, you get the drip and, you know, I just, I was too vain. That's why I never put it in. Because people always tell me, dude, you're wasting all this money. You could go get like fucking two bags and shoot it. You'll be good. But I just couldn't see myself putting that needle in my arm. I would have. I know if I would have stayed on the street and I wouldn't have gotten in trouble, eventually I would have. Oh, you're dead then? Everybody does. Yeah. Nobody, nobody thinks they're going to, nobody thinks they're going to get to that point. But they do. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. I see a lot of weed smokers turn, to, turn into heroin. They just don't get that hit anymore. What, weed smokers? Yeah, turn to heroin. Just don't get that hit. <sighs> see, weed's like a tricky thing, you know, like, it can be a gateway the first time around, but I think if you've already been and entered the belly of the beast, I think weed could have the opposite effect. Because it gives you consequential thinking, something that addicts lack. We don't think consequences. We think about consequences after we already got high, mm -hmm. not before, right? Like a normal person, <laughs> right? <laughs> right or wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just think that that marijuana. I don't indulge myself. I don't do it. Yeah, but same. I was twelve years on it. You know, but but I, you know. I work at the, you know, More Life Recovery, the rehab in mm -hmm. Metuchen, New Jersey, and we do allow that. We're like one of the first in the state of New Jersey to allow that. And I don't think it's got, I think it's gotten some pretty good results. You see some of these kids, they get off psych meds. It just keeps them, it just slows everything down. They know. I don't think weed is going to bring them back to that, to the bad stuff. If anything, weed slows everything down just a millisecond to where you have where there is a higher probability because everything is slowing down 
that you have that tiny, that drop more time to make a better decision. I don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, if you're smoking all day and sitting in bed and eating and stuff, yeah, and you're taking your ambition, that's a different story. But I'm saying, I'm not a proponent for it, but I'm not, I'm just saying, I don't think it's the end of the world. Yeah, if I had kids and that's all they did, I would be fine with that. But there's so much drugs out there, and it's benefits, even talk about MDMA and fucking ketamine and so much <laughs> shit where it can help the brain and so for me i'm not promoting fucking drugs for by all means do you know what i mean i'm it's not my style but as long as people are okay in life and they're, people want to do what they want to do but for me it's just to try and do things as naturally as you can and then um, but again everybody's struggles and battles are different what was the worst drug you took well, i'd probably say the crack crack even though people think meth, meth is not as crazy as crack because with methamphetamine, the do the dopamine receptors, they stay open. So it's like you stay high. You could stay tweaking, but with the crack, they close. So it's like you need more. So I think because of that and that, you know what I mean? And that constant chasing for that next hit where meth, it's not like that. I think the crack was the worst because it's a very violent drug. People will do whatever for that next hit. I've seen the places that it brought me to. Heroin didn't bring me to bad places like that. And just the people you're around. You're like giving a guy a ride. He's robbing your CD case. Who's going, taking your phone out of your pocket while you're driving. It's a, it's, it's just bad. So I would say probably crack. Is that the most expensive one? It doesn't seem expensive because you're buying, you know, like $10 little hits, but you got to keep going and going and going. So yeah, I would mm -hmm. say it's... it's a did you ever, when, when did you ever look at yourself and think, fuck me, what... Where's my life going? Because I used to get high, like I say, coke for four days, vodka just, and then Valium to kind of yeah. suppress the feelings. But yeah. I used to look at myself sometimes and think, fuck me, you're a mess. But I always believed, I used to sit and get high with everybody and used to get full of coke. But I used to sit there and think, look at the fucking state of all you. I used to judge them and think, you are a mess. But I was a mess. But I always knew that I would make changes. I always knew there was something internal that wasn't always going to last forever. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know, I was just trying to convince myself because I used to look at myself and I hated who I'd become. I was in my 30s and I just, I hated it. I didn't like the potential I had as a kid to then just fucking wasting my life. Do you know? It was yeah, horrible. Yeah. Did you ever look at it? Was there a moment you looked at yourself and thought? Yeah, it's scary because it's like, in the beginning, we actually think that we have a little control because we don't know what this is yet, yeah. right? It seems like a recreational thing. We do it on the weekends, but then we start to discover we're not like everybody else because they stop, right? <laughs> they're getting married. Uh -huh. You know, this guy's like, they're making changes. Like they're going to, they're leveling up. Okay, they did this already. But we're still doing it. Mm -hmm. And then we say, eh, maybe this is a little worse than I thought. And then before you know it, it's like your life becomes unmanageable. And it's it's it, it consumes your every thought, right? Every thought is like, where am I going to get more? It's just a horrible way to live. And that's why I've dedicated a big portion of my life to like <laughs> hoping people don't go down yeah. this road. It's like, trust me, yeah. you've been there. I've been there. We're telling you, it's not going to be, it's not going to end up good. I laugh because <clears throat> I'm surprised I'm still here. I just fucking love that. Like people used to, like you say, people at 28, 29, they kind of make changes and grow up. I kind of inherited my nephew's friends. They were like 23, 24 because they were just mad as fuck. So I went back kind of five, six years because I didn't want to grow up. I didn't know what the fuck I wanted to do. <sighs> so we just used to go travel Spain, Ibiza. But then it was prisons. It was fucking just everything was enhanced. But the thing is, I, I probably laughed more in that period of my life. I fucking laughed. Now I came, I become more serious. Everything's kind of serious. Every conversation I have with people is kind of serious or I'm trying to change their life or I'm trying to give them advice. There's not as much laughter. I've noticed the laughter goes as I'm making changes, but because I, I used to fucking love having a right good laugh. Yeah, yeah. But because I was fucking high and I didn't know what the fuck was happening, but it's a, uh, it's a mad, it's, a, it's mad how we intoxicate ourselves and hide from pain though, isn't it? It's, it's just crazy how we just our bodies are the most expensive piece of machinery on this planet. We'll clean our house, we'll clean our car, but yet we'll fucking put coke, our heroin, our crack, our weed, our Valium. Take our, care of our car, right? Wash yeah. it twice a week. <laughs> People fucking snort heroin, smoking crack, yeah. freaking killing our liver with all the liquor, drink a bottle of vodka. How much and, were you spending a day? Oh, at my worst? Yeah. I would say like I was spending... 
seven to eight hundred a day because I'm spending two hundred dollars on heroin, twenty bags just to snort, just to be normal, and then I was smoking like about five hundred dollars a crack a day, probably more. Some days more, but I would say on the average, it's a lot of money, you know. Yeah. See, I was never that extreme. I was <clears throat> I always had mine as well. It was a gambling was my main one. I gambled everything, lying, stealing, cheating, <clears throat> done bad things to get the money. Like that was the worst. But the things I used to do to get that money to fix that habit, well, fuck me, that's bad. Gambling's bad, but like I say, it's the hidden addiction. You can hide from it, but it's the anger, it's the frustration, it's the why am I still staying in my mum's house in my thirties and fucking. You get angry with yourself that you're not doing anything with your life, so then you get full no of, progression. Yeah, so you, that's when you then turn to drink and drugs because it numbs the pain and you pretend that you're happy, but nobody sees you when you're sober and you're crying into your fucking pillow. Yeah. It's mad. So see, because you did you not jump out a car with your paranoia as well and yeah. split your skull? Yeah. <laughs> was, you, you ever get paranoid like yeah, that? I still get paranoid. I get paranoid when I'm sober. Yeah. Yeah, I get like that too. Somebody under that. And that would be like two days doing this shit. In a room like this, in a motel, just, you know what I mean? Yeah. But at least we got some good stories to tell, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, if there's yeah. one thing that we could, yeah. positive, that we could get out of, take out of that, you know, that madness. Mm -hmm. We got great stories. We got probably better stories than, the yeah. you know, the next guy, mm -hmm. you know? How was it jumping out of the car though? Do you think because you were high it saved your life? Because yeah, you and drunk because I just went with yeah. the fall. I mean, at that point, I thought it was the best thing possible because I thought I was going to die. So I thought this is the only way to save myself. But these guys were my friends. They're not going to do that to me. But you know, when you're like that, you think this crazy shit, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm laughing, mate, because <clears throat> I know how I understand that. People are paranoid. I've had friends pull out guns and knives because they think people are talking about them. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're thinking, what the fuck? Yeah. You're talking about your cunt? Yeah. I seen a kid, he passed away, my friend Angelo. I seen him getting paranoid before I ever got like that. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? Dude, there's nobody there. Stop looking, please. Mm -hmm. And then when I started getting like that, then I said, oh, wow, I know why, you know? Yeah. But. Did anybody ever say to you, <laughs> you know yourself, you never listen anyway because we feel as if. We know everything when you're an addict. Nobody, or you're too ashamed or too much pride, but then because of the talent you had, the new opportunities you had, did nobody ever say, look, your fucking head's up your ass. Like, come on, look, look, time's time for change. Did nobody ever try and... Yeah, plenty of people, <clears throat> but they just never listened. But, you know, when I got in trouble and I was uh, in Rikers, Ale, uh, Rikers Island, New York City jail, <clears throat> I had overdosed on heroin and morphine. And I... Uh, got a visit from my friend Corey and my cousin Pat. They were attorneys. And uh, they told me that day, like, we're not going to support you anymore. You know, you're overdosing. People are trying to support you. We're trying to get you past this. That day, like, I've been told this a million times, but that day, for some reason, it just sunk in, you know? Mm -hmm. So, present time, the, the night that changed your life forever, you were high. I think you tried to break into a house. Your friend... Well, I didn't try to break in. I tried to get the guy's attention, so I broke his mm -hmm. window, but... I wasn't trying to break in. So if what, I was trying to do that, I wouldn't have made all that noise. So what yeah. happened then? So you've tried, you smashed the window and then an undercover copper pulls out. Well, he thing. wasn't undercover. He was off duty. He lived next door. He came outside, I guess, to see what was going on. I was leaving by that point because I couldn't get the guy's attention. As I'm walking away, I heard a male voice say, don't move. That's when I turned and that's when I started getting shot. So he's just started shooting you? That's correct. And then... You've ran, and then the friend you were with, who was the friend? I was with uh, my ex-girlfriend's father. His name was Stephen Armendo. Was he a nutcase? Yeah, he was nuts. And he killed the copper? Yeah. And he got shot, what, he seven shot. times yeah, or something? Yeah, he got shot, shot anywhere from six to nine times. I know he got shot several times, so. And when when did you wake up and realize the damage? what damage had been done? It was a couple of days later, I woke up in the hospital after having, you know, my spleen removed, part of my colon. And I remember there was a doctor. He bought me the newspaper and he said, you proud of yourself? Look, you killed a cop. What's that moment going through your mind? Is that the worst moment of your life? Yeah, because I always thought to myself, you know, maybe one day it's like my worst nightmare. I'm going to wake up in a jail cell and someone's going to be dead and it happened. That's kind of what happened. Instead of being in jail cell, I was handcuffed to the hospital bell bed. But... 
I just couldn't believe like where my addiction took me that someone's dead now because of this, you know, but they say cop and stuff like that, but that doesn't make it any better or any worse. It's a human being mm -hmm. lost his life. Yeah. Know? But as, as, as much as it's a heartbreaking story and it's a sad story, you never killed him either. Do you know what I mean? But there's, Whose idea was it to go to the house? My my idea. Does that play in your mind that it was your idea, but yet he ended up, if he if you never went with that idea, then he's not going to be there. But again, hindsight and all that, you can never you can never change it. But does it play in your mind? Well, of course it does. <clears throat> and yeah, he had a gun, unbeknownst to me. But if he was there, I was there. And he had the gun. I don't. Nothing would have happened other than a broken window. Because eventually we would have realized the guy's not there, and we would have left. <clears throat> I mean, he killed the police officer, but the police officer shot him first. I'm not saying that it was right in either way, but as a normal human reaction, if you have a gun, whether it's a police officer, whether it's a civilian, if someone's shooting you as a normal human reaction. You're going to shoot back, right? Life or death. You know, so it's just a terrible thing all yeah. the way around. You know, his family, of course, him dying. My family, what they went through. My dad, you know, needed a heart transplant and he's dead now. So, you know, there was it was a terrible thing on both sides. How long were you in hospital for? In the beginning? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, uh, only a few days. Were you in a coma? No. I was on life support maybe the first day, and then I got better. Like I said, they took my spleen out and stuff like that. But we got there December 10th, and I was in the hospital the 10th until probably the 19th. And then the 19th is when they moved us to Rikers Island. What did the media do? Was that a field day for them? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because they're already like when a cop dies and gets killed, that's already a big story for them. Mm -hmm. But then when, you know, it's at the hands of an actor that people know in an iconic New York classic film, it was big for them. It was definitely a big story. So what happens when it goes to court? What are you charged with? Are you charged with culpable or break house breaking or are you, you charged with murder? What are you charged with if you get shot? I got charged with uh, felony murder. It's murder of the second degree felony murder because it was in the commission of a felony. What sort of sentence would you look for that? That would have been 25 to life. 20 what? to life, 25 to life, yeah. Because it's like, <clears throat> felony murder means you attempt to commit and you commit in furtherance or in immediate flight therefrom, a felony. So that means if we go rob a store and some old lady's in there, she has a heart attack because she's afraid, that's felony murder. You killed her. Even though she just died of a heart attack, you didn't even touch the lady, but because you're robbing the store and it caused her to have a heart attack, that's felony murder. So... It's the same thing as you shooting her. You're going to go to, if they find you guilty of that felony, you're going to jail for felony murder. What are you thinking then when they've charged you with that? I didn't even know it was a charge. I wasn't well versed in the law and all that. I've never been in trouble like that to where I had to like look up these charges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me, you know. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm charged with murder? Hell, I didn't even have a gun. You got shot. I didn't have a gun. I, I, I didn't I kill him. And then like, oh, well, it's felony murder. I was like, oh, wow. Then I realized this is serious. It was already serious because somebody died. But the fact that they were charging me as a murderer, that was scary. And I was also charged with burglary. Yeah, you can you can accept that one, though. Yeah, so I mean, if it looks like, because it's like, yeah, it's a broken window. You got drug addicts. But that's all, like, a lot of that's circumstantial. Because think about it. Okay, we're drug addicts and we broke a window, but does that mean we're actually robbing? By breaking the window, could we have maybe not been trying to get the guy's attention or other things? So you're saying that the broken window only means burglary? No. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. So when you're in prison then, going through that, were you still getting high? Or were you trying to get your head sorted? Where's this? In prison. Were you still... In the beginning, I was still getting that? high. I got... I got what the was the paranoia like in your cell? You know, fuck fuck. I, was, I was snorting <laughs> heroin and sniffing and, and taking morphine. Yeah. So it's no paranoia. I love that. I just used to nod out on the dope and itch. And just used to, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it kind of took, like you were saying, like, you know, you, 
your life's going nowhere and you're fucking in my mind. It's definitely not going anywhere. I think I may stay, be in jail for the rest of my life. So it was a tough pill to swallow. So I had no part in death, but I was taking these pills and starting this just so I didn't have to feel the pain of that, of my, my reality, of my current reality, which was facing life, you know, incarcerated, which was, you know, was very painful. Were you ever suicidal? Uh, no. Because that's a heavy one. High on drugs, lost your career, yeah. in prison for a cop killing. It's a lot. Well, yeah, and I was shot up when it happened. <clears throat> you know what I mean? I was coming off heroin, so it was everything. That was a lot. When was the moment you decided, okay, enough's enough, I'm going, going to get clean? When I was at an attorney visit with my friend Corey and my cousin Pat, when they came to see me in the box when I had an, uh, a dirty urine. And that's when they told me, we're not going to support you anymore if you keep doing this shit. And for some reason, it just like clicked, like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do this. Because you overdosed in prison, he says? Yeah, well, it was jail. It was because the difference between jail, then I went upstate to prison. But I was in jail, yeah. I overdosed November 12, 2006. What was that like? It was scary. <clears throat> because it's not like you're home. Is that the first time you've ever overdosed? No, I overdosed before that. I overdosed like twice before that. You know? But uh, that one was bad because it's like, you know, like I'm not in enough trouble and then this happens. It was bad, you know? I got questioned. They had New York City detectives come down. They wanted to know what was going on. And uh, it was a big investigation because it's like, this guy's a high-profile inmate and he's getting drugs and fucking overdosing? What are you guys doing? How are you doing your job when this guy's doing this? So it was, uh, they really wanted to get to the bottom of it. What, they, what uh, weight would you? <laughs> what weight? Your weight? What, at my worst? Yeah. 132. Right now, I'm like 170. 170, 180? 170, 175. <sighs> yeah, it was like 132. It was bad. Have you got photos? <sighs> I don't you know. You can send me them if you ever do, but... Is Maybe that, is I that, might have one for my old ID picture. Is that, <laughs> at, your, is that, is that at your lowest then? Yeah. In prison, charged with murder, overdosed, fucking can hardly walk, you've been shot up. Yeah. Man, it's fucking... That, that's a film. That's yeah. a movie yeah, in yeah. itself. Yeah, yeah. High profile actor, addicted to drugs, fucking involved in yeah, a no, cop killing, a prison. You know what it is? I don't want to anger. I don't want to anger the family. I want to do it at the right Yeah, time. I get that. You know? Um, I mean, I don't have any more obligation to them. I even be, I even won the civil case. And the preponderance, you know, that's the burden of proof is much lower. So that should speak volumes about how I was not guilty of anything. Because when you plead a civil case, I mean, it's only they only got to find you liable 51%. It's by the weight of the more reliable evidence. By a preponderance of the evidence. So the more reliable evidence said that I was not guilty. You know? So hopefully people see it that way. So prison and jail in America, you says it's not the same. What does that mean? Well, jail is when you're awaiting trial or whatever, and then once you get sentenced, then you go to prison. <clears throat> you know, like a holding. You know when they yeah, have yeah. you holding? Mm -hmm. That's jail. Because that your case just the same. Yeah. That, prison and jail is just the same. I, I was there for three yeah. years, being held <clears throat> before trial because I had a co-defendant. We didn't want to go to trial with him, so he went first. Then I went. It was three years later. Then I went upstate for another five years. Did you get a deal or anything offered to you? No, well, yeah, I did get a deal for my cooperation at three and a half to nine. That was way in the beginning, and I didn't want to take that because, you know, it's like I bought this guy to that house. If it wasn't for me, he wouldn't have done that. You know what I mean? I bought him to the place, so I said, hey, I was, you know, a big enough boy to make the decision to go there that night, and I just said, you know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I'm going to go to trial. So they offered you a deal to yeah, first turn a, against yeah, him? Yeah, three and a half to nine for cooperation. I didn't take that. And then before trial, they offered me 15. And uh, for, you, for you getting sure? Yeah, 15 years. And uh, my lawyer, Joe Tacopina, he said that he thinks we got a really good shot at beating it, which we did, and uh, that I shouldn't take the plea bargain. A lot of people would have. Because 15 years is 15 years. You know what I mean? If you think about it, you know you're coming home. There's a date mm -hmm. on some piece of paper somewhere that is saying you'll be home on this day. People like that because when you don't know, when you got like a 25 to life and you got to go in front of a parole board and you don't know if they're going to let you go home or not, that's kind of sucks. What was it like going through the court case and seeing the, the police officer's family? Uh, was that hard? 
to seeing where your addiction kind of took you? Yeah, well, it was his mom and dad. They died in the beginning of broken hearts. That was really hard. When I saw the picture or the funeral on TV and I saw his father in the front crying, that really, that really affected me. Because he was an old school guy like my dad. And it looked like it could have been my dad crying for me. And this guy lost his son. So it's very serious. So how long did the trial last? My trial was about a little over a month. Were you nervous? Oh, yeah. Because you could potentially still be in? Yeah. <clears throat> it was very, very... I could have gotten convicted of murder and been away still. So what what happened then? What was the final... So the guy who killed the cop, did he... He got your... so guilty of, of murder in the first degree. So could have no self-defense or anything like that? No, he... he because it's a cop? Well, that's There's still why they to get, be a fair trial as well. Well, that's why they gave him a murder one conviction. The murder one because it was a member of law enforcement. But uh, yeah, he got natural life without the possibility of parole. Who shot first? The cop shot first. So he, how, so he came out and said, don't move. And that's when I moved. And that's when he started shooting me. Scary though. Yeah. <laughs> so, he get, so when he gets found guilty, does that not make you even more paranoid? Because one's already been guilty? No, I think it... it or did it, it help you? It helped me. Because if he get away... now they don't want blood as much. They got some already. They know that's the guy that did it. So anything to them more would be a bonus, but they got what they wanted. <coughs> but they did want me really bad. They wanted to put me away forever, and I don't think that's <clears throat> fair. I didn't shoot the guy. Why, because it's a cop? I got to go away forever? I was a drug addict. I changed my life. I turned my life around. I help other people now. But... The fact that they were trying to put me away forever, I think that was a little too much for the amount of time that I should have went away for. It was the perfect amount of time for me to turn. <coughs> you know, but we went through a lot, my family and I. And, uh, you know, they made it out <coughs> like I was the killer for all those years. The other guy, they don't even know his name because newspapers don't get sold. They get sold. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I remember one time I had a, you know, a potential book deal that didn't go through because the publishing company thought I was the killer. And it's like, it's not cool. So when you go to court, what was the verdict you got? Uh, <clears throat> not guilty of murder in the second degree. I was found guilty of attempted burglary with serious physical injury to a non-participant. So, if so the, the sentencing guideline was three and a half to 15 years, and I got 10. For smashing a window? Yeah, well, that's, they're saying it was a burglary that ended up in a death. So. <clears throat> yeah, well, listen. Well, that's a big aggravating God rest the, yeah, yeah, big, big aggravating factor. Yeah, God rest the man's soul yeah. by all means. But it's still, do you feel as if it's a bit injustice as well? Or did you feel as if you deserved that? But 10 years is a bit much for a smash in a window, you get shot. What happens if your father in law never killed him and it was just you and you get shot? Do you feel as if you would have got compensated? Oh, I would have sued. Yeah, of course. Why are you shooting me? <clears throat> Why are you shooting me? Because I'm on drugs? I don't have a gun. I didn't show you or give you any reason to do that. And I didn't that night either. You, Yeah, I, well, you said don't move. I moved. But you didn't say police. It's 530 in the morning. If I said don't move to you, you would have moved because it's, a, once again, a normal human reaction. I'm all jumpy smoking crack, of course. So, uh... <sighs> If I was there by myself that night, nothing would have happened. I mean, maybe I would have gotten shot or whatever, but as far as he would still be alive, no doubt. Do you feel lucky to still be alive? Of course. With all the drugs and the shooting and all of the course. jumping out the moving car? Of course. <clears throat> Why do you think you're still here? I mean, I think it's it's clear. I think it's very clear that it, I'm here to help others that went down that are going down the road of addiction, just as you are. You made it through, you know? And I think that God wants us to be, you know, go to like we're going to be like his elves. He's Santa Claus, and we're the elves. We got to help him, right? What was it like first day in prison after getting ten years? Were you clean then? Yeah, I would already been there three years, but then we went to trial, so it was three years later. Was that a relief that it was kind of all over? You feel as if you could start yeah. holding your life again? Well, yeah, that, but also. It was good for my mindset because now I know I'm coming home at this time. So now within this amount of time that I have left, I could set goals for myself. I went to school. I got a degree that I paid for out of my own pocket. I got sober. I continued my recovery. 
So it was a lot, a lot of good things that I did while I was there. I made the most of the time. What prison were you in? I was in, well, first Rikers Island. It's a New York City jail. It's in East Elmhurst, Queens. And then I went upstate to the Oneida Correctional mm. Facility. And then at the end of June of 2011, they announced that the place was closing because of budget cuts. They closed a lot of facilities that year. Empty bed space. So then what happened was we got transferred. And you know I'm glad that we got transferred because Oneida was like four and, hour, four and a half, five hours away. That's a lot. My father was old. You know, he wasn't old, but he was sick. And it was my mom don't drive. So it was hard. Sometimes I didn't see my parents two, three months. But then we went to this place called the Hudson Correctional Facility. That was like an hour and a half. Perfect. Every weekend I have visits. Saturday and Sunday, every week. I was a very busy guy. How was prison for you? How were you treated? Because you must have been a celebrity in there. Um, everybody would have loved the Bronx too. Everybody would have seen that. Well, you know what it is. Does that help you though? Or has it become a it hindrance? Could, it, it, it could go either way. Yeah. Some COs... They'll treat you better because of it. Or some of them will treat you worse. They say, I don't give a fuck who you are. You are where you are because you did something stupid. And someone lost their life. So this is what it is. But, you know, and then you get some inmates. Yo, I love that movie. But then you get some that, like, want to cut you or stab you. Just so they they could say, I'm the guy who stabbed that guy, you know? So for the most part, though, it worked out for me. Thank God. See, my face is clean. I didn't get cut. Nothing like that, thank God, which could have easily happened in Rikers Island at any point, any day. I'm just glad, you know, it, it, it happened the way it should have. And I'm here in one piece. My allergies are bothering me a little bit. Yeah, same. Um, People think me and me and you are hiding now. Did <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But other than that, I'm, I'm a happy guy. I'm a happy camper. Yeah. What was the worst thing you seen in prison? Well, I've seen this in Rikers Island. I've seen this one kid get stomped out really bad. He was in a puddle of blood. I thought he was dead. He was lifeless. Because I seen it, like I seen it happen, and it was like, because these are like concrete floors, and his face was getting stomped to the concrete. It was loud. Boom, boom, boom. And I didn't even, and I couldn't believe how long it took to knock him out where he was still. And that was pretty scary. I think it would have been worse if they would have stabbed him up. I mean, I think it was worse when I saw. I, I don't think it would have been as bad if they stabbed them up because what I saw was just bad. It was just bad. See, when you were going through your changes, did you do a program or anything? When I was upstate in prison, we had to do ASAT, which is alcohol and substance abuse treatment, and then ART, <clears throat> which is um, aggression replacement training. Those were two mandated programs because I had my crime was drug fueled and because I, anger. It's a violent crime, so they, 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 they you know, mm -hmm. associate violence with anger so if you've got your anger in check maybe you wouldn't have done that how hard does it go through the changes in trying to stay on the path and do the right thing uh well it gets easier now because i've been doing it for so long and i've seen how much you know better people have come into my life better things and just how opportunities you know what i mean present mm -hmm. themselves more when you're like doing the right thing that good stuff gravitates mm -hmm. toward you so i wouldn't say it's hard at all i think it gets easier how long did you do in prison? Well, I got 10 years. I was supposed to do eight and a half, but I did eight because I told you I went to college, so I got a six-month time cut. Eight years out of 10? Eight percent of... Yeah. That's a lot. You think so? Yeah, usually, UK is usually half, sometimes two-thirds, but just if you, could, if you do your courses and stuff and anger management, you get out quicker, but... Well, because this was a violent crime, so it's 85%. If you... If it's nonviolent, it would be 65%. What was it like getting out? Uh, clean? Yeah, I was out clean. It was good because my dad, you know, he was sick, but he was able to see me clean and mm -hmm. strong and working out. And it was, it was kind of like bittersweet. I know I was coming home and to see my family, my friends and everything, but at the same time, it's not like I'm a war hero that just came back from the war and people are waiting for me, you know, open arms. Hey, Lilo. A lot of people hated me and still do because of what happened, you know? So it was, uh, it was tough because you're going into the unknown, not knowing. You've never knew the world like this because something so bad happened. Now, how are people going to perceive me? What's it going to be like?
now with all this new technology too, you know, the iPhone and I didn't have, I first got you know, my first iPhone. So there was a lot of changes, but then there were a lot of things that were still the same. There was a lot of the people, same people doing the same things as they were doing before you left. They just look a little older, mm -hmm. you know? Were you ever scared that when you came out, you would start again? Because the temptation's real. It's always well, there. I was on parole. And when you're on parole, they don't mess around. They'll put you right back in jail. So that was good for me to be on parole mm -hmm. because I knew for a fact I couldn't mess up. So being that long, being sober that long, and then coming home and then learning how to live sober because of parole, because you have to with parole. But it's also at the same time, while you have to, you're learning how to live life not dependent on drugs and alcohol. So it worked out well. It worked out well. One of the parole supervisors, I still speak to him very, you know, I still speak to him all the time. He was definitely a very, you know, he was a motivating force in my life. He looked out for me when I was there. Not looked out for me, not gave me special <clears throat> treatment, but, you know, saw that I was a good guy and just steered me in the right direction. Don't get me wrong. He would have violated me in two seconds like anyone else. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I was blessed to have him in my life and to still have him in my life. What about the acting career now? Well, yeah, I mean, it's not like it was when I was doing Bronx Tale, but I got some, I got a film called Sleepyhead that we, we did two years ago, but we finally got it back from the writer director after a long legal battle. Mm -hmm. So we're working with some people over at Lionsgate to rework the film, coming out with a totally different ending. It's going to be awesome. It really is. Were you, in a, were you in a Chris Brown film, 2020? How did that come about? Well, it was a... It was a Chris Brown uh, video. video. Music yeah. video? Yeah, City Girls. Yeah. yeah, what happened? How did that come about? This guy, Matt, Matt Goldstein, he emailed me and said, hey, Lilo, I'm a producer for Chris Brown, and we got this video. Did you ever see the video? No. Oh. That video is like a feature film. They probably spent more, they probably spent like 20 million. It's unbelievable. It's one of the best videos I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So he said, we did this video with Chris Brown, and in the beginning, there's a little room for a voiceover. He said, and I couldn't think of a more iconic voice than yours. So, you know, let's, uh, let's, you know, let me run it by Chris and see what he says. So I, you know, I said, okay. And Matt's a great guy. He goes, Lilo, he goes, I spoke to Chris and his exact words were, I fucks with that nigga. So I got to, <laughs> yeah. How was that then? Like, because obviously with the reputation and being in prison, people would have been scared. But, but that they... guy, Matt. Turned out to be a good guy. I love that. Yeah, but yeah. even even after that, he still stayed in touch. Christmas. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a real person. Because like people, when they don't need you anymore, it's like, all right, I don't need him. Used. But, but this guy still reached out to me for Christmas, and that it's an extension of who he is and yeah. the kind of person he is. Yeah. But that's how that happened. Uh, and yeah, it was cool. Like they sent me the microphones because I said, yeah, I could just do it on my iPhone, you know, because the the microphone's pretty good. And they were like, no, no, no we'll send you a real. We'll send you a real microphone. <laughs> you don't got to do yeah, it on the yeah, phone. Yeah. So uh, they sent me all the stuff and they sent me all the stuff and we were like on z like video chat while I was doing it. And to be honest with you, I did like four or five different takes that I really liked, but we did them a little different. The one that they chose was probably the one I liked the least, but I'm still in there. Still, have, still, still work. It's still he's a superstar. A superstar. Massive. Yeah. He's massive. Yeah. But I appreciate that when people because just because you've done bad shit in life, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. Do you know what I mean? People fuck up, people make mistakes. You've you've rectified it. You never killed anybody. Right. No matter if it annoys people that I say that, you never you never fucking pulled the trigger. You never killed anybody. You never right. you've made mistakes, you were a fucking drug addict, you put your hands up to that. You're now helping people. It's a beautiful thing, if anything. Yeah, but people don't people don't see it that way because a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are brainwashed and they think they have to be a certain way. But it's like, wouldn't you want what I want for your own kid? Ask yourself that question. If this was your own kid, what would you want for him or her? Especially since they're doing the right thing. What did you want? them to get a second chance it's like you know what i mean i would be dead if god didn't want me to have a second chance right he would have taken my life there would have been a force bigger than us that would have said you know what i don't think this guy should be here anymore he's not doing anything and you know not that it always works out like that but he kept me alive for a reason and other people should see that because these same people that oppose me oh cop killer piece of shit if their kid needed me i would be the first one to help because i know what it is 
You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it has nothing to do with this other stuff. It's something much bigger. It's deep. You don't want that for your children, but you would want them to get a second chance, just it's, like my yeah. my parents did. Is people scared to work with you now? Or, of course. Yeah. Do you feel that? I think the public perception, I think, you know, they may say, oh, he'd be, be great for this role, but, you know, do we want to hear all this bullshit? Do we want to deal with this? But I think as time goes on, I think it'll get easier because, you know, as time is going on, you get so many people, like a lot of these younger casting agents in LA and stuff like that. They don't even know who I am. They didn't, they didn't even know the Bronx tale. So they don't even know about what happened, which is a good thing. Mm-hmm. I don't care. If you don't know about the Bronx Tale, but as long as you don't know about the other thing, we could start fresh and you could look at me and judge me based on who and what I am, what I'm here with you and how I treat you. That's all I ask. What sort of part do you think you could play now? Oh, I could play so many parts. I've been through so much. Uh, I like doing voices and different accents, but I think as an actor, I definitely have more depth because I was able to tap into emotions that I've never even thought were inside me. But, you know, like feelings of sadness, of anger, of disappointment. Because when you're in prison and facing life, that, you know, stuff that you've never felt, you will start to feel. Because there's there's no, there's nothing that, there's nothing as deep that I've ever felt in my life. And then I realized like, wow, like this is an emotion too. Like I never felt this way. But now it's like when you felt it, you kind of felt how you felt when you felt that way. And it's like maybe you could like try to do it again if you need to for a part. How do the cops treat you? Because obviously you they'll feel as if you killed one of their own. Did you ever get any sort of looks or any sort of anger towards you? Yeah, of course. Did you? you? Know, yeah, get, but you know, like for the most part, like since I've been home, it's going to be at the end of this year, it's going to be 10 years that since I'm home. I mean, I've had a couple of run. One guy spit on the floor, but then I spoke to him. I seen him a couple of days later. He was cool. A lot of times when it's the cops one-on-one, they're cool. But I guess together they have to take that stance Mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. And it is what it is. You know, they're a a brotherhood. They stick together, which I respect very much. I mean, you can have cops from wherever. They're a cop. They're a cop. And they'll stick together with the other cops from different cities and whatever. But you got to respect that. I wish, you know, Mm -hmm. more people stuck together like that, you know? Yeah, but you don't get that anymore. There's no brotherhood. There's no loyalty. There's no... We spoke to like, like the cops here. That they love the Scottish, which I didn't know, but they've all been friendly. I fucking love New York. I love the people. I love everything about it. I love the buzz. I love the friendliness. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's more opportunities for some reason. People seem to want to help you more. Yes, it's fucking crazy, but where's not? Yeah, yeah. Where's fucking nuts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Go walk down Glasgow for 10 minutes, you'll be like, ah, they're all fucking crazy, but yeah. that's life. How's your headspace now? As far as what? Just life and feel it, your feelings well i've gotten to the point in my life where i used to be a little more high strung and just arguing with people and starting you know to where i'm not like that anymore it's just because it's like kind of recovery i'm recovering from that kind of behavior just like i was recovering from my addiction so i know how to do it it's like in the beginning because like when you start doing good things eventually you're going to start seeing good things come to fruition but it doesn't happen right away but right now, I'm at the point, my headspace is, I'm too old to argue. If you fucking told me one plus one was six, it's six. You know? It's six. It's like the, it's like the, my friend told me this, uh, this like, let's not even a joke, but you got a lot, you got a tiger and a donkey, a jackass. They're looking at the sky and the jackass is saying, the sky is green. And the tiger says, no, it's not. It's blue. No, it's not. It's green. It's blue. So the tiger says, all right, let's go talk to the lion, see what he says, okay? The lion says, okay, so what's going, you know, what's what's the story? The, 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 the donkey says, I told him the sky was green. He's saying it's blue. And he said, the sky is green. Now you go away. He said, you, you're punished for, deal, for arguing with this idiot about something that you know the sky is blue. So like I, when I, I heard that, like I apply that to everything. Why argue? You know what I mean? Even if something is worthy of an argument, but still, why argue? I, love is fleeting. So many things are fleeting. They come and go. But one thing that I want and I know I can achieve is peace. I just want peace in my life. And if you carry yourself a certain way, you don't put out any of that negative energy. Because I have in the past. I've, you know, like, like there's certain things about, you know, reasons why I was hurt. 
And, you know, when you're hurt, you hurt other people. That's the bottom line. Normal, well-adjusted people don't say, oh, fuck, you know, they just don't do that. And I realized when I was hurting is when I was hurting people. But now I'm getting to get to the point where I just let everything go. Because, I, you know, like I always took everything as a personal attack. It's not. People can't, everyone has their own problems. You may look at this guy or this girl and think on the surface, wow, they got a great life. They don't. You don't know what they go home to. So I'm at the point in my life, my headspace is, I don't want to argue. I want peace in my life. And like I said, if one plus one is six, then it's fucking six. Did you never get a book out about your life? A book? Yeah. No. No. I'm sure one day I will. I'm sure one day I will. I'd like to. I mean, it'd be a great book. Yeah, definitely. There's so much There's so much there. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Do you feel yeah. as if there's a lot of red tape now because of that incident? But then again, it's 10 years ago. And like I've it's said- It's more than 10 years. It's 20 years ago. It's December 10th, 2005. What? That's when it happened. 18 years ago? Yeah. Oh, fuck's sake, man. But you, you got out of prison just nearly 10 years ago? Yeah. I got out New Year's Eve, 2013. It's a long time, man. Yeah. But, and obviously, because, but everybody deserves a chance. And like I said, you never killed anybody. Do you know what I mean? You, you're making changes. You're trying to do the right thing. You're helping kids stay off the streets and try to not make the same mistakes you did. How's that feeling? Try to help people now and show them there is light at the end of the well, tunnel. It's a great, it's a great feeling to be able to be in that position and, you know, of a role model. You got to take that seriously because, you know, you have a platform. You got to use it the right way. So many people don't. You know, they do musicians and rappers. You know, they want to talk about drugs and selling drugs and fuck this and fuck that. And I just think that's irresponsible when you have a platform that big to spread that kind of stuff. Even though it's music and it's an expression, you know, it's not like a movie where you're playing a character. It's more about you're saying that you're this person and that you do these things. So people will, you know, will try to follow and copy that. Mm -hmm even though it's negative and I just think it's very important to like teach people that, you know, teach people and tell, you know, teach people the right way, teach people the right things. Who would you like to work with? I mean, I'd probably like to work with, uh, I mean, I know Pacino because De Niro and Pacino were always my favorite growing up as an Italian kid. And, you know, mm -hmm. even though I'm Colombian, but I, you know, basically an Italian kid, I grew up with all Italians and I ended up De Niro and Pacino were like two gods. So I would like to work with Pacino because I already work with De Niro work with Pacino. If you say a director, I would probably have to say someone like, you know, Darren Aronofsky. Who's he? He did The Wrestler. Oh. Black Swan. Yeah. He's an awesome director. But look at, um, who's the guy in the, the, the wrestler? Mickey, Mickey Rourke. Rourke. His life. The wrestler then, boom. He was, he went missing for fucking 20 years. Yeah. He was the next big thing. Again, ended up fucking it and what, obviously the plastic surgery and that, but what a part he played fucking on. That was my, favorite movie of his that yeah. was his best one the wrestlers are unbelievable it's the film that i wrote never it's, meet your heroes yeah it's about addiction and it's going to be with the girl from the bronx still it has that wrestler feel mm -hmm. like that beat down loser type guy mm -hmm. that was Which, a perfect part for him yeah. because that was kind of his life, life. I, I thought in my own opinion but right unbelievable actor and he's, he's a, he seems a good guy i know people know who know mickey uh, Rick, mickey and they just say he's a mad cunt but he's solid solid yeah and yeah, what a great film. But look, Guy Ritchie films now. Nah. I'd imagine he would take, like, give you a part. Or... I like Guy Ritchie. He's lock, sock, and two smoking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, he's big. He's big in the UK, huh? Yeah, massive. He's probably the biggest. Oh, really? Massive. Massive. He's done some great films. But it's all the kind of crime gangster, eh? and it's the directing, the producing, everything that goes behind it. It's mad. Where do you go forward for the future, brother? What's your plans? Well, I still want to help people, you know, I want to maybe one day have maybe uh, own a treatment facility or two or three or four. Um, but definitely, and I still want to act. I'm, I, I've, you know, caught the writing bug. Like I said, I wrote a, a screenplay titled uh, Never Meet Your Heroes about addiction with the girl from a Bronx Tale. We're going to have a daughter in it. We're not the same people from a Bronx Tale. Um, so I like writing and, you know, I have some really great real life experiences that I can write about that your average person doesn't really have. So it's like, it may have been fucked up when it happened, but now it's something that I can use to make art, mm -hmm. you know? So Have you ever seen De Niro since? I spoke to him after a Bronx too. Oh yeah, I, I spoke to his daughter not too long ago. She lost her son, Leandro, mm -hmm. rest in peace from addiction. Mm -hmm. He was a young kid, 20s, early 20s. 
But I spoke to and saw De Niro when they were doing The Irishman at the end of 2017. What did they say? Well, I went on the set. Um, makeup artist, uh, his hair was hair, hair, not makeup artist, his hair guy, uh, hair, uh, Jerry Popolis. He knew where I lived, which was not far from where they were shooting because we did a Willie Allen film and he did my hair piece. So he remembers when he came to my house to fit me for the hair piece. So he knew I lived right there. And he sent me a direct message on my on the Instagram at like 5.30 in the morning. I'm on the treadmill. He was like, hey, listen, we're going to be right near where you live. You should come down, say hello to Bob. He's got a light day. So that was the last time I saw him, which was cool. Yeah, that's still amazing though. Yeah. Still amazing. Really Even cool. that guy reaching out to you to, to set it up. Like, yeah, yeah. Was he happy for you that you're on the straight and narrow? Because he must he would have known. Oh, absolutely. He even left a comment. <clears throat> they did uh they gave me a little piece in the New York Post, which I was very thankful for, Joshua Hartnett. Uh and they got a comment from De Niro and he did express that he was really happy that I'm on the straight and narrow, which was very nice. He could have said no comment. How hard is it to, because the parts you played, it's, it kind of fell into your lap as if this, the stars had aligned for your life to be that way, but how hard is it to be an actor? In what regard? Just the stresses, the pressures, trying to keep getting work. Because people see people on the big screen and they think they're millionaires, but you know yourself, it's, it's nothing like that. So how hard is it to try and stay in that industry without, because you're in your 40s now, you've played some of the best roles, you've, yeah, and yeah. you're still trying to find them. Well, because I have something else that I do that I, I find very gratifying, you know, and helping other people and working at the treatment center, because that's a very big part of my life, because without my sobriety, movies, none of that means anything. So... It's like acting has more or less become more of a hobby nowadays where it's like, I wouldn't say I would take it or leave it. That's not the case. But what I will say is I don't really depend on it to make a living like I used to. I think when you depend on it to make a living and pay your bills from what you make from acting, then it can be scary. Because it's like feast or famine. You know, you work two, three films in a row, then you didn't work for eight months. So it's like, you know, you keep dipping into that savings, It's it gets hard. And eventually that money's going to run out, you know? Uh, but for me, after everything I've been through, just to be able to get the opportunity to do any kind of acting, to me is a, is a win. It's a big win. So I'm not really too concerned about not getting roles and stuff like that. I'm happy to just be here. Yeah, it's a fucking blessing. Yeah. It's a blessing that you're still even here to tell the tale. Yeah, I see all these, something like these, 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 you know, these actors, and I see on their Instagram, they post nothing other than their acting. Headshots, this, that. It's like, don't you have a life other than this? Because it's like, when you only this, if this doesn't go well, you're going to lose focus because it's like a liability. Hmm. That's why you need to put your eggs in more than one basket. You can't put them all in the same basket. You know, especially look what happened. You just had a strike for three months. So as an actor, if you're depending and banking on only that source of income, it's going to suck for you. Mm -hmm. You know? When are you at your happiest? I'm at my happiest when I'm with my nephew and my nieces. My mm. nieces are twin girls, Madison and Alexa. They're seven. And my nephew's 11. His name is Vincenzo. Mm -hmm. That's when I'm at my happiest. Yeah. For anybody watching that's in that life of struggle... In that life of pain, can't quit drinking or taking drugs. What advice would you have for them? I guess because you know you're still playing the tape out. You're not gonna. You're not realizing or fully realizing what's gonna happen. But what I can tell you from experience is that when you do this stuff excessively, nothing good ever, ever is gonna come out of it. When you can drink like a normal person, you know. Two, three drinks, get a little loud, scream and yell, have a great night, dance, go to sleep, and, for, you know, it's, it's over. That's okay. Lucky bastard. Right, that's okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. Or you get people like, you know, they got cocaine left over from the last party. <laughs> How do you got something left over? <gasps> I'm borrowing yeah. money. I'm trying to, like, you know. <laughs> I'm stealing money. My mom's I'm, bus to try yeah. and get <laughs> My mom used to hide her purse. <laughs> They used to have money. They used to have money in the wall. Yeah. I used to find every place. I used to take their credit cards and gamble. Oh, really? And I used to try and deny it and try and get the the the, the statements in every month and trying. It was just 
it's a horrible existence. Any addiction, any, even overeating or undereating or anything that can be detrimental to your health and mindset. Why do you think that makes your life unmanageable? Yeah. Whether it's eating, whatever, and addiction, you know, it's an addiction is an addiction. But that's crazy, right? Your mom, James, yeah. what the hell is yeah. this charge here? Yeah. And you make excuses. Yes, I, sometimes I used to deny shit. No, is it, and you've, you're blat it's blatantly you, but that's just where the pain of addiction takes you. And I've lost many loved ones through suicide and addiction, and and I know the, the struggle is real, um, but you can't change everybody, because if people try to change me back in the day, I used to tell them to fuck off. Yeah. Um, but now I understand it now, and if somebody reaches out, I'll always try and reply and try and give them some guidance, or even a little voice, not just the well done, proud of you. I always give everybody the time of day, but what's the main ingredient for change do you think to become a better person say again what's the main ingredient you think for change to become a better person is the willingness to want to change mm -hmm. you know what i mean lilo how did you do it how did you do it i just say because i really wanted it i believe if anybody really wants something they can have it i mean you're not going to become michael jordan because you really want it and you practice no that's not realistic but something that's realistic and attainable which is recovery. Anybody can get clean. I'm not better than anyone else who doesn't get clean. Anyone can get clean. But the level of how much you want it is going to determine whether you actually get it or not. Yeah. And support is a very big part of it. And it's scary as well, changes. Because when you start changing, it's the conscience. It's everything that you've done is a fucking... So, because that pushes you back to just keep drinking or taking drugs because it just blocks out here. It numbs the pain. So when you start becoming cleaner, it's the, the conscience of the people you've treated wrong and the things you've said, the things you've done. You think, wow, how the fuck did it go so bad? Because everybody's got great potential. Everybody's got something great in them. And Everybody. You can yeah. learn something from everybody's, you know, got something that you don't. Mm. And that's beautiful thing about this world that, that we live in. Everybody's different and we can learn from other people. And, you know. Yeah. For anybody, like I say, watching, <clears throat> again, what advice would you have for them to... If they were struggling with addiction, what's the best advice you have for them? That, you know, nothing changes. If nothing changes, nothing changes. It's not going to just go away. You're not going to wake up one day and you're gonna, and it's just like going to go away. If you don't work at it, it's going to eventually kill you because that's the goal. That's its goal. That's what addiction wants to do. It wants to kill you. Mm -hmm. So if you feel that you have a problem, get help right away. Right away. You know Carol O'Connor. He yeah. was Archie Bunker. Mm -hmm. Do you remember he did that public service announcement commercial in the 80s because his son died of cocaine overdose? Remember he was having those horrifying hallucinations? Mm -hmm. And then they got a close-up and he said, keep your kid off drugs if you want to save the kid's life. That's the bottom line. You know what I mean? If you recognize early on that you have a problem, that you're doing a little more than you're uh, some normal person, chances are you do have a problem to get help as soon as you can. Because if you do it as soon as you can, the addiction is not going to grow to something bigger that it's going to be that much harder to stop then. So my advice to you is if you feel that you have any kind of a get help right away, because that's going to give you your best shot to get clean. Mm -hmm. Lilo, for anybody that's watching, that's maybe wanting to reach out and speak to you, where can they contact you? Um, I'm on Instagram, Lilo, L-I-L-L-O underscore Brancato, B-R-A-N-C-A-T-O. I'm on there. I post two videos a week, motivational videos, post motivational quotes every day. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much, a, 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 you know, I sprinkle a little acting, a little family in here and there, but yeah. it's mostly about inspiration and motivation. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? No, I mean, you know, like I said, uh, you know, if you... If you feel that it's something that's that's taking control of your life or making your life even this much unmanageable, it's going to get worse. So get help as soon as you can. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't think I left anything out. Lulu, it's been an absolute pleasure, brother. I wish you nothing but the best for the future. You too, bro. You're a real gentleman. Yeah, thank you. Because this guy was a, you know, just an Instagram uh, face for a while. Yeah. You're a good guy, bro. Yeah, I appreciate I, that. I really, I really mean yeah, that. Yeah, and likewise, I genuinely wish you all the best for the future. Thank brother. you, brother. God bless you. Thank you. Even though I didn't understand half of what he said. <laughs> That's a great fucking accent, though.